I had a teacher back in seminary who used to use the phrase existential cash value in questions anytime students would make a point, anytime they'd say some conclusion or make some claim about the faith or, or even reciting something from one of the Lutheran confessions or from the creed, he'd stop and ask us, okay, I heard you recite the correct answer, you learned from the textbook or from the Bible or from the catechism, but what does it mean? What's the existential cash value of it? What difference does it make? In your actual lived life, that phrase, the existential cash value, has stayed with me over the years. Because, to be honest, sometimes we church folk are really good at reciting answers we've been told are the right answers. Whether they are answers we've gotten straight from the Bible, or words we have um, learned to recite from a creed, or from a hymnal, or things we recall from memorization back in catechism class for those who jumped through those hoops and went through that experience in uh, Lutheran childhood. And sometimes we don't get to the point of asking, what does this actually mean? What difference does it actually make in the way I live my life? And I think sometimes, let's just be honest here, part of why the watching world doesn't seem interested in the faith that we have to share, the reasons that we gather on Sunday mornings, is that it looks at us Christians and says, I know you recite a bunch of things you believe about God, but it doesn't make a lick of difference in how you live your life. You don't look any different, act any different. It doesn't seem to change your course of direction and what you do, how you speak, how you think. I don't see any difference, so why don't I just... Do what I'm doing now and save an hour on Sunday mornings. What's the existential cash value of what you followers of Jesus say you believe? And it's because that question, that phrase keeps coming back to me that I find myself pulled to a story that we're going to be hearing as the first reading this coming Sunday. And it's one of those stories that's easy to gloss over, both because it's looks kind of like a downer, and it comes on a day when our other readings might sound more interesting or exciting or uh, familiar, and it's easy to miss this one, and it has become a favorite of mine, not just because the central figure in it shares my name. This story comes from the book of Acts, the seventh chapter. This comes from the very end, and it's about a member of the early church, sort of an early community organizer in the Jerusalem church who helped manage a food distribution ministry, and his name was Stephen. And at one point, he has riled up a lynch mob against him because he's told them the truth about their history. By the time we get to late Acts chapter 7, he has told a crowd of people their own history, and they don't want to hear it. He's reminded them how in the story of ancient Israel, over and over and over again, the people turned from God and God's ways, and God was gracious and gave them a new beginning, and they kept turning to the ways of empire, or becoming a conquering nation, or trusting in their wealth and their power, and how they forsook God's ways of justice and mercy and of care for one another. He told their history, and worst of all, he told it in a truthful way rather than a way that let the people listening think they were always only the white hat wearing heroes. And because they didn't want to hear their history told honestly, even including that they killed Jesus, they decide they need to silence Stephen rather than face the truth of their own history. And then this happens. Filled with the Holy Spirit, Stephen gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears and with a, with a loud shout all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. When they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died. 
I know, it sounds like something of a downer. It's the story of a lynch mob killing somebody, of this angry mob of people who don't like what Stephen has said, and so their solution is, we'll grab rocks, drag him out of town, and kill him, throw rocks at him to kill him, and it happens. And nobody steps in to save the day, and nobody stops it, and in fact, a young man named Saul, who we Christians know later will become Paul, the apostle who writes half of the New Testament, is standing there watching it happen and approving of what's happening. He's the coat holder for a lynch mob, and Stephen dies. He pays the price of holding on to his faith in Jesus and truth-telling with his life. And it occurs to me, something powerful is happening, that this isn't just the story of a victimization. This isn't just the story of a martyr, although it is that. It's the story of what the early church took seriously about their faith in Jesus. And both that they were willing to lay down their lives for it, but the way they embodied the love of Jesus. That it wasn't just the early church believed, hey, there's life after death, so it's okay if I die. They believed not just that there was life after death, but that Jesus was the key to understanding life and life beyond death. And that Jesus' way of responding to hostility would become their way. So this is an important story because Stephen isn't just a helpless victim. It's not just he doesn't realize by saying things that make people uncomfortable, they might throw rocks at him. Or that Stephen doesn't realize things are moving too fast and maybe if he were smart, he would have brought his sword or some rocks of his own and lashed back out. Stephen embodies the way of Jesus in this story by refusing to answer evil with evil, by refusing to answer their violence with violence of his own, and by refusing, even with that said, not to speak the truth of an uncomfortable telling of history. All of that is what the early Christian witness looked like. There's something that is really, really beautiful, i got to tell you, about how this story plays out. And, and Luke, the narrator who writes the story of Acts for us, makes clear a couple of connections between Stephen and how Jesus faces death, right? Not only does Stephen get in trouble for truth-telling, as Jesus often got in trouble, not for trying to launch an insurrection or overthrow the Romans with violence. Jesus isn't doing that, but Jesus regularly upsets people by speaking truth to the powerful, and people perceive that as a threat, and then look for any trumped-up charge they can find so that they can get rid of Jesus. Same thing here with Stephen, right? Stephen hasn't like threatened uh, death or to attack, or he hasn't, hasn't harmed anybody. He's just told history in a way that made people squirm. And so they cover their ears, and instead, Stephen's response echoes the death of Jesus, as Luke tells it, right? Not only does Stephen see a vision of Jesus alive and standing there at the throne of God, as if to say, the one who I believe in, I know he's alive, I can see him. He's able to see the heavens parted, and there he sees Jesus standing for him. But also, Stephen's last words, into your hands I commend my spirit. Echo Jesus' last words from the cross in Luke's gospel. Into your hands I commend my spirit. And Jesus prays, Father, don't hold this sin against them. Forgive them. They don't, they don't know what they're doing from the cross. So Stephen also prays, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. This is a story not just of somebody being brave enough to be willing to risk angering people and also brave enough to be willing to lay down his life for his faith. It is also Stephen's conscious choice not to return evil for evil. Not to say, well, you're coming at me with rocks, so I'm going to get my sword out because i got to defend myself. He doesn't. He deliberately doesn't. He knows the way of Jesus is, I'm not going to attack you even if you attack me. He understands that at the heart of the mission and message and gospel of Jesus is love that doesn't answer hatred with hatred or evil for evil and is willing even to lay down its life for that. It's what it looks like to love your enemies, right? It, loving your enemies doesn't mean that you decide to start agreeing with what they say or that uh, you have to be quiet when your enemies are saying something wrong or untruthful, but rather, I'm not going to seek your destruction. I'm not going to destroy you or hate you or do violence to you, deliberately refusing to defend himself, instead being willing to be a witness for the truth, because that's what he saw in Jesus. 
because the way of Jesus actually made a difference in his life. That's it. The early church didn't just say, oh, Jesus rose from the dead, and therefore I guess there must be life after death for us, but it doesn't really do anything to how we live our lives. Now, the early church took seriously, not just that Jesus died and rose again, but that Jesus' power is in the love that refuses to answer evil with evil and has such confidence that God's got our back, that God's got a resurrection ace up the sleeve that we don't have to lash back out. And when they come angrily, we don't have to return evil for evil or violence for violence. We are living in a time when increasingly it seems like the headlines are story after story after story of somebody felt somebody uh, at their driveway or uh, ringing a doorbell uh, um, was a threat and answered with immediately, I have to stop them, they're a threat, I have to shoot them, I have to kill them because I don't recognize this person, they're a threat. And it is so easy to justify, I got scared so I lashed out, I got scared so I shot, I got scared so I attacked. And Stephen shows us an alternative that takes Jesus seriously. Stephen shows us what it looks like to believe so deeply, not just that Jesus rose from the dead, but that the Jesus who died and rose is the one who loves his enemies, and that that's our calling and our way of life, that he's willing not to pick up a rock or throw it back or pick up his sword to fight and defend himself and not to kill somebody else in the name of looking out for himself. He's willing to lay down his life because he gets that's the kind of love we meet in Jesus. This is a story with existential cash value. This is a story that says the good news of Jesus isn't just fire insurance for a day after you die. It's about how we live and embody love, the love that doesn't hold grudges, that doesn't keep record of wrongs, it doesn't look to settle scores or get even, but even dares to love enemies. That's our way of life here and now. And yes, beyond the grip of death in the life to come. When people saw the witness of people like Stephen, it changed things. It changed the world. People were drawn to this kind of faith because they saw people living out what they said they believed. In that regard, Stephen's story challenges us 2,000 years later where it's easy and comfortable both to name the name of Jesus and not get into too much trouble for it, but also where it's easy to say I'm a Christian and then practice vengeance and grudge holding and scorekeeping in every other area of our life and say I've got my right, I can hit you back or I can hit you in advance because I'm afraid. Stephen's story calls us out and says, no, nope, that's not what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. We will be people who love the way Jesus loves which means we don't keep score, we don't keep grudges, we don't hold those things against even those who would see themselves as our enemies. But we're willing to embody the way of Jesus, not just in the words that come out of our mouth, but the ways we live our lives and even the ways we lay our lives down. That's a story we're going to be hearing this Sunday and part of the bigger conversation for this coming fifth Sunday of Easter, and we invite you to be a part of it. So join us then. See you Sunday.